Today's episode of In the Trenches is brought to you by System 12 Guitar Method. Sign up today at lionroxy.com. In the Trenches with Ryan Roxy. Hello, 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 and welcome to another live stream episode of In the Trenches. I am your host, Ryan Roxy. What is happening, folks? Man, I know. I was just saying before we press record... This hotel room that we're in, we're lost in Canada. You know, usually Alice Cooper's lost in America. We are lost in North America, in Canada, and we are on the West Coast. So it's early for me. And um, our guest today is in the UK. So it's a little bit of the roles reversed because usually I am broadcasting from the North Pole in European time and our guests are on the West Coast. But guess what? Everything changes in rock and roll. Everything is um, interchangeable. Everything is synonymous with good times and, um, I don't know, longevity. Because uh, I love it when we have true legends of the game here in the trenches. And I'm talking about the game of rock and roll. But before I talk about the game of rock and roll, before I talk about the game of rock and roll, if you are listening to us on one of the audio broadcasts, thank you very much. But guess what? I want you to be here on our YouTube official channel because that's where we have the live chat. And there's that subscribe button. Vic, our producer, just manically threw his arms up in the air and said, I almost forgot to introduce. But no, it's all part of the plan, folks. I knew it was coming because I'm talking about the game of rock and roll, right? Thank you for subscribing. Thanks for building up our YouTube official channel. Tell a friend, tell an enemy. We don't care because we love you in the live chat. Um, Positive, good energy, and always great comments that are coming from there, from the RGA. But again, I'm talking about the game of rock and roll, and uh, our guest today is a true legend of that game. And if you think it's a game, um, or if you don't think it's a game, then you haven't been playing long enough. The last of the rock stars is what I'll call him today. Uh, One of the original founding members of the iconic band Uriah Heep. Would you please welcome into the trenches guitarist, songwriter, and dare I say it, living legend, Mick Box. Hello, Mick. Hello, mate. Good there to see you. Go. you. Happy days. <laughs> oh, it, you have you exude right out of the gate such positive <laughs> energy. Every time I see you, um, there's a big smile on your face. It's hello, mate. How you doing? Or it's more like hello, mate. There's no H in there. Hello, hello mate. mate. No H, mate. No, drop the H's. <laughs> <laughs> happy days. There's no H in happy days. <laughs> How you doing, man? You're in the UK right now, and we have got so much to talk about but i guess the the biggest biggest news is that the band although we had a little bit of a setback with the pandemic you're finally able to go out and celebrate that big 50 yes indeed that, oh wow there it is so you're right heap 50s and in order to just you know take that into uh sort of scope and take it into into yourself of how long it takes for a band how many changes a band can go through through all that time uh, we need to go back to go forward with mick box what do you say vic shall we oh. yeah. you want a more you own a motorcycle mick no 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 i no. think um bernie shaw has a, a holly davidson but you know no it's never been my thing. Speed on 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 wheels is not not a good thing for me. No, <laughs> I, don't think, okay. I don't think I would have lasted. <laughs> Ca- cars and motorcycles. Not what. What is your sort of as a rock and roller? What is your guilty pleasure as far as hobbies go? It's hobbies. Well, football. Yeah, um, and, you're, and you're talking the one. You're talking the round ball, the one where you actually play with your foot, <laughs> not the NFL. The one you call soccer, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, football. Um, in England, yeah, there's a team called. Tottenham Hotspur, which um, are just down the road from where I live now. Um, so, so it's been from, you know, boy to man, a fan. And uh, so, yeah, that's, that's really one of my um, my passions. That's yeah. great. That's great. I mean, I've, living in Europe as long as I have now, I've definitely gotten into football more. Uh, the, the big myth is that people in America don't understand the game of football, uh, soccer, if you will. 
but it's not true because every kid plays it growing up. I played soccer all the way up until high school. Um, and then it just kind of faded out. It's, it's coming back in popularity, obviously, um, these last few years, but you know, there was for the longest time, Oh, Americans don't understand football. No, we, we played it growing up. I mean, did you play uh, football growing up as well? Yeah, I did. Yeah. I, 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 um, I did, you know, my school team and then went into London school boys and, um, and I kind of moved up to there. People were interested in the uh, England setup at the time. But um, I noticed when I was, because um, I'm quite virtually challenged. <laughs> wait, wait. I'm, I'm not a tall guy. And, vertically uh, challenged. Welcome to the club, my friend. <laughs> I, I, but are, are, should, should guitar players be tall? I think guitarists or, or, or even musicians in general. I mean, if you look at the guys in the Stones, they're they're very very um, petite, and um, <laughs> I it, feel it, we have to be down and dirty, man. You know, and that's where we down are. Down and dirty. <laughs> yes, we're closer to the ground. We're closer to the ground. Trust me, I hear every day. Uh, yeah, that I that that uh, I do have a taller wife, uh, a much taller wife. So um, I, I I've always enjoyed the fact that, and and I feel that the guitars. We feature the guitars more as a smaller frame. You know, the guitar is featured. When you, when you have a super tall guy playing the guitar, yeah, 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 it yeah. kind of almost looks like a toy. This kind of looks like more yeah. of like, you know, I think we're it, equal it, with it. It actually feels more like a part of your body, you know, whereas it's not a guitar on a big, tall person. It's, it, it is part of your being, you know, which is great. Well, I've always said that uh, guitarists play the guitars that their heroes played. And I do have a little bit of information, a little bit of the 411, if you will, um, that some of your early guitar heroes was actually the Les Paul and Mary Ford. And more in that jazz sort of, um, you came out of the jazz school. Um, is that sort of the reason why to this day you play a Les Paul or do you play different guitars as well? It was kind of, um, kind of that. Uh, feeling really because um, I, you know, I had a, a few lessons um, for about ooh, probably about six months and the teacher in, in, in the east end of London where I live um, he used to be the second guitar to Django Reinhardt um, Alan Hodgkinson and um, so his obvious teachings were very jazz orientated so and I liked all the voices of the chords and and the melodies and things so um, I kind of fell into it very very easily um, but I got to a point after a about six months because my mother can only afford um, my lessons every Saturday. <laughs> so I'd get the Saturday lesson and by Saturday afternoon I could play it. So I was getting very frustrated. So I got to a point where I went to hell with that. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to learn it all myself, you know, and uh, like why didn't all... you just, why didn't you just sign on to YouTube? <laughs> <laughs> there was no YouTube. my friend. <laughs> we were sitting those days. We were still dropping the, the needle on the record, you know, to, to learn parts, you know, uh, in we, fact, we, one we... of the first songs I learned was, um, uh, song by Les Paul Mary Ford called Nola. And it was a very fast instrumental. Diddle it and did it and diddle it and diddle it. And, and um dropping the needle on it. it took forever to do it. But once I got it, it was marvelous. But then it was only years later, not only did I find out that Les Paul was an innovative guitar, he was always an innovator of studio equipment. And he played it half the speed and spread it up. And that's what I was trying to copy. So I was trying to do the fast version. <laughs> you were basically trying to learn something that was almost impossible to learn. Because, Already double speed, yeah. yes. <laughs> because that, that is something that, that a lot of people don't uh, take into account is that Les Paul invented and was one of the pioneers of multi-track recording. 100%. And uh, obviously the Les Paul guitar, that was his baby. It was kind of a cross between a, you know, it was a 335 with a solid block in. It was a semi hollow body at first. It's, I, I forget what the name of that first guitar that, that he brought in um, and Gibson passed on it. But also Les Paul invented reverb. Did you know that? Yeah, reverb and, and double tracking and all sorts. Yeah, he, yeah. Was, he, was, he was immense in, you know, with, without his expertise in all those fields, you know, I'm not sure we, we'd still be floundering. <laughs> now, did you ever get to see Les Paul play live? I, I was lucky enough to see him in New York at a small club when he would play. Like every, I think it was every Thursday he had a, a little uh, sort of jam that he would do, or maybe it was a Tuesday. Yeah, yeah. Well, a, a good friend of mine, uh, David Owen, who used to work with us as a crew member, he went to that, that show that you're talking about there yeah, and he yeah. went along and he got um, all my um, 
CD covers signed by Les Paul and a guitar wow. and, and a, um, a guitar plate which says to Mick, keep on rocking Les Paul. And of course, <laughs> it's, it's, it's picked there. They're, they're all up on the wall, mate. You know, treasured, treasured items. Well, I love the fact that, you know, right out of the gate, we know you're a bit, you know, classic rocker icon, but you are also obviously from the CD wall and back of you, a music fan and all, and you said, you know, to your left, I believe then there's your vinyl collection as well. So, you know, thousands of of CDs and and, uh, albums, you said uh, not so easy to transport from point A to point B though. No, they're, they're very heavy LPs, aren't they? I mean, I, uh, (laughs) I remember when I I first moved to this house and it's three stories and uh, I, I thought, well, what are we doing with my vinyl? You know, because they're all downstairs. So I went and bought these huge boxes and put all the vinyl in. And went to carry them up. I couldn't lift them. I couldn't, couldn't even get them to the first step. <laughs> so I decamped them into smaller boxes to get them up there. Then put them in the big box, you know, because they, they're very weighty. You know? Well, the band, Uriah Heap, I mean, you guys have been able to re- release so many albums over the years what is your personal uh, favorite platform to release uh, your music on because you've gone through everything you probably you know vinyl uh, cassettes cds uh, mini disc perhaps um, you know all the way up to today's like Every sort of invisible I- invisible uh, file formula but what is your favorite format to release music on it has to be vinyl, mate. Vinyl, vinyl, vinyl. Yeah, it's got that warmth to it. It's um, and it's got that tactile feeling where you pick up the album covers, as you see there, and uh, people used to frame them, put them on the wall. You know, you'd, you'd put the album on and just soak yourself into all the information on the cover and the artwork and everything. And uh, yeah, there was a vinyl is 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 the best best format at all. The tangible experience. And I'm glad to see that uh, it's coming back. And and, uh, a lot of the newer generations are appreciating it as well. So um, we are talking here with Mick Box uh, from the band, original uh, founding member of Uriah Heap. But before that, there were a couple bands that I want to address. And uh, perhaps you can uh, give us some insight on The Stalkers. And another oh, band yeah, that you yeah, had yeah. called Spice. Um, <laughs> Look at that picture. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> now, that's Vic Chalfon, our producer that combs the internet when he's not doing in- incredibly um, strange search words. He's uh, looking up Uriah Heep. Um, <laughs> now, I understand the stalkers, how you got the name. I don't know if it's from personal experience. Um, <laughs> how, how did the name Spice come about? Um, well, <laughs> With the band Spice, it was the, it was a professional band. So Stalkers was the semi-pro band, and then we, we decided Spice was going to be the first, um, you know, professional band. So we entered into it with that. But we 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 called ourselves Spice because in the culinary world, there's so many different spices that you can use for food and everything else. So we kind of wanted our music not to be just one genre. We wanted it to encompass, you know, folk, rock, blues, metal, as it's called, you know. We and uh, jazz. We wanted to include all of it, in, and so Spice seemed a, a great name um, to choose. You know, for that reason. So for all the hoopla, you were the Spice Boys before we, anything else. Oh, before the Spice <laughs> Girls, I'm not sure that's a claim to fame or not. <laughs> 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 well, you you dodged the bullet by not going yourself. No, the Spice Boys, Boys without the, without the dance moves, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> but both of those bands, uh, uh, you teamed up with your uh, lead singer David Byron, and which leads me to the obvious question: like, how did you get your names? This uh, the Stalkers and Spice. How did the name Uriah Heap come about? And um, you know, even to this day, hardcore fans. They, they ponder this. I mean, I know you can probably find it on Wikipedia and this and that, but we want to hear it from the founder's mouth. Where did the name Uriah Heap come from? Okay, now when we were discovered in um, by um, an impresario called Jerry Braun, he came down to a blues a blues club in in, in uh, High Wycombe in, in England, saw the band as Spice. It was a four piece, and he said, uh, "Look, I really like you and and our singer David Byron. It was David Garrick at the time." before he changed his name. And then um, he took us into the studio. He said, well, if it starts working in the studio with all your original songs, 
um, we'll, we'll talk about taking the further. Of course, it started working brilliantly. But I was um, I was very keen to try and include some keyboards because, um, believe it or not, I was a big Vanilla Fudge fan. And nice. uh, Mark Stein, you know, was one of those innovators of the hammered organ. And uh, I just loved his sound and, and what he could do with it. And I also thought that the hammered organ was one of those instruments that, that could encompass all the various musical styles we were, we were embracing at the time, you know, because it can be very gentle, it can be very aggressive, it can be very, very it can really, you know, lovely, it can be very angry, you know, it can be everything. Very so, emotional um, instrument. So then we, we, we uh, our bass player at the time was Paul Newton, and he was in a band um, called The Gods with a guy called Ken Hensley. And so he contacted him, he came down to the studio, loved the setup, loved the songs, wanted to get involved. So then we had a keyboard player. So with a musical template changing, we decided to change the name of the band. And um, it just so happens it was the 100th birthday of Charles Dickens, the great English novelist. And right. um, there were, you know, adverts all over buses and TV and radio and everywhere, you know, you know, to celebrate this, of course. And um, our manager took his two sons to see um, a film version of one of his novels, David Copperfield. And in that, David Copperfield, there's that old Dickensian accountant called Uriah Heap. And he came back and mentioned it to us. We thought, well, you know, no better than use the name of the band from a great English novelist and one of his characters. So uh, it, 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 we, we liked it very much. Also, on, on the other side of thinking in those days, you know, in print, which was a big thing then, because, you know, you had all the manager makers and the enemy, you know, all the papers, um, right. not magazines, just all music papers. Um, it was Deep Purple, Black Sabbath, D, P, B, D, you know, uh, all early parts of the alphabet. And we thought the U would actually stand out. So that's another way of thinking about it as well. Yeah, so. again. <laughs> that's the full story. A little <laughs> bit of foresight going on. Like like Uriah Heep, U-H, a couple of years later, there's a band called Van Halen, V-H. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, just yeah. like one letter away in alphabetical order before those guys. <laughs> And there's a lot of strength in that, you know, especially the Van Halen logo. It's fantastic. Absolutely. Well, Uriah Heep, there you there you have it. You heard the, the how the name the band got its name uh, from one of their founders, Mick Box. We have here on In the Trenches, and we appreciate you guys coming in each and every week. If you'd like to uh, continue to be part of this whole family that we have going on. Uh, just hit that subscribe button right there down in the right corner. Thank you very much, Vic Chalfont, for putting that up. Um, I want to get into the music because you, you mentioned keyboards. And when I listen to, can I, if I can call it the heap, right? The, 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 yeah. A lot of people just yeah, say the yeah. heap. Um, when I listen to a lot of the earlier stuff, there are shades definitely of progressiveness. And that's where the vanilla fudge, I think, influence uh, sorts come in. Um, the keyboards definitely lend it to a progressive vibe, but when I hear the vocals and, and some of the guitar riffs, it's it's there's a bit of UK glam a la Slade as well in that I can sort of hear. And did the, did the did it's that a big happen? old melting pot, isn't it? Yeah, there yeah. was a melting pot, but that's yeah, that's where yeah. I'm getting at. During those times, did you? Uh, all play the same uh, venues or was there a lot of influence or would you listen to whose single was coming out when, and then you go, Hey, I kind of like that. Maybe mm -hmm. we'll, we'll borrow a chord here or we'll borrow a sound here. How did that work out back in those it, days? It was kind of, it kind of, I think as you soaked it all in, you didn't really um, actually go and say, Oh, we'll try and do something like this, something like that. Because I've always been of the mind. If you do that, you can only be second best because they've already done it. Great. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got to find your own um, your own uh, road, if you like. Um, so yeah, I think I think you just soaked it all in. I think, I think if we go back to the early days where we first got the keyboards involved, and we got into um, you know a bit of progressive rock and a bit of this, bit of that, you know, um, I think that was more born out of the fact that when you signed an album deal back in those days, you signed with a label for six, seven albums, right. and uh, you grew with the label, the label grew with you. And there was no uh, pressure on you, but a sound like this, look like this, be like this. And so we were allowed to let our music just grow in, in, in whatever way it grew. And so I think that's why, um, you know, our first album's got a mix of everything, folk, rock, jazz, blues, it's got everything. And then we get to our second album, Salisbury, where we've got that 27-piece uh, brass and woodwind section on a, a very long number, you know, which is, which is uh, uh, something that 
you'd have to sit down with accountants and managers and everything to see whether it was worth financially to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas in the old days, you just did it. Done. The next week it was done. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and I think that by then we'd, we'd travel the world a bit and we found when we got to look at yourself, our third album, we felt, well, hang on, you know, this is um, this is where we want to be, you know, a true rock band. So that's when we started settling down and then we got the success with Demons and Wizards and everything else, yeah. <laughs> but with, in regards to that first album, that debut album, um, you stopped using H's a long time ago. At the, as the beginning of this interview, when you said, hello, uh, the, the <laughs> debut album, uh, very heavy, very there you go. No H's in, in Uriah Heep. Although, why is it? Except for the name. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, why is it just Uriah Heep? It should just be Uriah Heep. The Eeps. We've officially the changed <laughs> the Eeps. <laughs> The Eves, yeah, mate. Yeah. <laughs> we have Probably many somebody. times had had the name spelt wrong with H E A P. Guilty, uh, guilty as <laughs> charged in one of my posts this week. I had to spell correct it or repost it. Yeah, I well, know. You're, you're one of many. Let me tell you that. Well, it's I now that I know that it's one of the accountants <laughs> for the Charles Dickens, you know, author and all that stuff. Now I know the backstory. I will never. From now on, it's just E E P for me. <laughs> all right how about that but but, that, but it's cool that you the record label back in those days record labels would actually allow you to grow allow you to develop um because it was that that first you know very heavy very humble uh wasn't really embraced at least it wasn't by rolling stone magazine at first where actually one of the <laughs> one, of, one of the uh, women who reviewed it promised to kill herself if this band makes it so i, I mean have you what, kept what in was, touch or did you go to her funny, funeral what was very funny about that was that um she said if this band makes it she'll commit suicide and in the same um the, the next Review. paragraph was um and it sounds like a third-rate Jethro Toll. Now, let me tell you this. There's not one of your eye heap that can stand on one leg for a show <laughs> and play their <laughs> instrument. So that's out the window. And, uh, you know, the, the, I think the proof in the pudding is we're still here 50 years later, 52 years later, still doing what we love, still have a passion for what we do. And where is she? <laughs> <laughs> That's all I can say. <laughs> all right. Maybe all right. maybe she's working in the local supermarket. Who knows? Well, there you go. Mick Box and uh, this woman who reviewed uh, very humble, very uh, very evil. Evie, very humble, um, are definitely not Facebook friends. I, I don't think they uh, frequent each other on TikTok as well. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. No Christmas card <laughs> list. <laughs> Speaking of TikTok, folks, everybody in the chat, we've had a big, big debut about that. You like the way I just segue into that, Vic? Is that amazing? Yeah, yeah, yeah man. What do you think of that, Federica? Look, <laughs> I know, folks. I know. Look at us on. Look at us on the screen. Uh, we. We are the epitome of the youth culture today. Look at us. You know, we are. <laughs> but and, and trust me, folks, and trust me, kids, any kids watching this right now, uh, we are m much crazier stuff, much, much more youthful stuff than perhaps you've ever done or your parents have allowed you to do. So the thing is, we, me, Ryan Roxy, and I don't know if, if, uh, if Mick wants to join me in this, but we are debuting our TikTok account today. And I know it's going to be, it sounds corny. I know we're about a year, a year and a half, two years late, but we're going to do it anyway. Um, do you have, are you into social media these days, Mick? Do you, do you post regularly on Instagram, Facebook, or dare I say it, do you actually already have a TikTok account? Um, I believe we do have a TikTok account, but it's what? not run by, it's not, not run by me. Uh, all right. <laughs> The Eeps. The Eeps beat out Ryan Roxy on a TikTok account. I love it. Um, and, and I won't join it until it's spelled correctly. Right. <laughs> um, no, no, we, we've got, well, yeah, of, of course, you've got to embrace all the media stuff, you know, now because it's a big part of what we do. You know, you remember in the old days, we used to have fan clubs and you'd send a letter, you know, you'd get a letter every six months about what the band's doing and stuff like that. And it may not even be from the band. It may be from the secretary signing it or whatever, you know, so... It was, you know, it was a diff different world then, you know. But now, of course, you know, I embrace Facebook and I talk to fans. And, and uh, I think it's very important, you know. I think it's, it's, a, 
if, if there's like all these things, there's a plus side and, and a negative side. Pros and, and I cons. Think the, plus, the plus side is you, you've got that immediacy with the fans. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. And and the thing is, there's a certain mystery, unfortunately, that kind of goes away. That mystique of a band uh, can go away a little bit with all this sort of transparency that you can find on the internet. Because you know, just by Vic doing a few Google searches, he's able to find like super early, early pictures of the band and, and news clippings. Whereas back in the day when we were, you know, both kids and fans of rock and roll ourselves, we'd have to wait until the magazine came out. For me, it was Circus yeah, it was Magazine. It, it was uh, Cream Magazine. I'm not sure which. Yeah, you, I what those, what yeah, was yeah. your rock magazine of choice back in the day, Mick? Um, well, it was more papers. It was like Enemy and Melody Maker. Um, um, but right now, there's um, which, which in, in England, which coaches for all the all, all the uh, classic rock bands, if you like, is is um, classic rock magazine. Classic so, rock magazine, great yeah, magazine. Yeah, and that's kind of that's kind of like our uh, that the, the we well I call it personally is it's the rock and roll bible, you know, because this you know you wait for it every month and it's full of information and, it, and it's it's a great read and it's well written and uh, very informative. Yeah, it's great, great, love it. Well, cool. What we're going to do now is we're going to take a small, tiny break, but we're going to come back and we're going to talk about uh, this 50 year anniversary, which is now 52. Let's just say 50 ish sort of concert. <laughs> and, and you guys are, you know, because you know what, as, as, as people get older and again, this is for all my TikTok fans, as you get older, you might start fudging on the uh, actual age that you are. So the band is 50 ish. We're saying going embarking on a 50 ish tours, and the dates are so incredible. So, we're going to talk about all these dates you have coming up in the next coming year. Of course, Alice Cooper and uh, Uriah Heap are going to be meeting up somewhere in Europe, um, hopefully this summer for sure. And if not, at least coming to a show because we've done that before. We've, we've yeah, seen yeah. These, we've come to each other's shows. I, I, we were talking like we I think we played a show in Estonia together, and then you came we did. in Moscow. We did in Tallinn in Estonia, yeah, and uh. Yeah, and, and, and you, I think you played Moscow and we played it the night after. So we came down to see you guys and had a great time. Yeah, I love Fantastic, it. Mate. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're here with guitarist Mick Box from the band Uriah Heap. We will talk more about all the uh, dates coming up. But first, we will talk a little bit about uh, playing guitar, learning guitar, and uh, the System 12. So, Vic, if you want to run that ad, let's do it. Hello, Ryan Roxy here from the Alice Cooper Band. And I'd like to talk a little bit about one of my favorite things playing guitar. Here at the RGA headquarters, which stands for Roxy Guitar Army, by the way, we've put together a guitar learning system that will get you playing and understanding the guitar faster than any other teaching program out there. We call it the System 12 Guitar Method. It is designed to make the most out of your time, your effort, and your passion for learning guitar. By combining new school technology, old school mentoring, and the number 12, we have invented a new way to teach guitar. And over the past year, we have helped so many people who wanted to start or continue their guitar journey do exactly that. Now, we'd like to help you. There's never been a better time to start learning guitar than right now. If you think it's too hard, the System 12 makes it easy. If you think it'll take too much time, the System 12 will have you playing in 12 weeks. And if you think it's too expensive, the entire System 12 costs less than what one private guitar lesson would cost you at your local music store. Check out the official site or the links below in the description of this video to join the RGA and get started on your guitar journey with the System 12 Guitar Method. Now, let's get back into the trenches for some more rock and roll. Enjoy the show. Enjoy the ride. Mwah! That's it. I had not seen that ad in a while, Vic. That was great. You kept the, uh, well, hey, have, I, I'm just curious about, because I, I have this thing called the System 12 that uh, a, a lot of the our audience, the RGA, has been learning the guitar and they picked it up. Have you ever done any sort of guitar course yourself and, and how to teach it? Um, no, I'm, I'm more of an intuitive player. You know, I just, I, I, I noodle <laughs> until I find something that interests me or, you know, I feel that I should record it very quickly and then develop it later on. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of that sort of guy. I'm, I'm not schooled whatsoever, to be honest. Um, to me, uh, music notes on an A4 is like tadpoles on a piece of paper. You know, I, I just I just don't relate to it at all. Um, so it's just by ear, really. 
Um, but I'm not, if I'm someone not says that. It's, if someone says that it's like you know I'm blues based or I'm pentatonic based, would you say your guitar playing leads more towards you know scaly, uh, more or like harmonic my, minor my, or or my, pentatonic? I would probably lean more towards gin and tonic. <laughs> <laughs> That could be your new method. The, <laughs> the gin and tonic mix, mix box. Learn the pentatonic gin, with, with a gin and tonic. Yeah, I'll have a gin and tonic. You see where it takes me, you see. That's a genius way of learning. You know, already I think I, there's people in our uh, chat that want to sign up. Where can I where can I learn how to play guitar and pentatonic gin and tonic? I love it. That's good. That's very good, man. The infectious <laughs> laugh as well, uh, mix box. Um, How's everybody doing in the band? Uh, like, because the current lineup, um, you know, I, I love Bernie. You know, uh, he's been around for for he's you've been playing with him for uh, such a Since long time. Nineteen eighty six. Man, such a yeah. good guy. Um, and you, and you got Phil as well, and like and Russell and Dave, right? Yeah. Is that the current lineup? Yeah. What and, and I think your dog wants to be in the band too, right? Yeah. There's a dog. We're actually looking after a dog um, <laughs> for somebody, and uh, we're getting married in Italy, and they've gone away to get all the arrangements done, and uh, we're looking after a little dog. But it, um, we've got our own dog, which is an English setter called Domino, and he's he's fantastic and gentle. But this is a bit of a yapper, <laughs> as you can hear. <laughs> we, you know, get the get 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 that one in the live chat because I'm sure it would ask a question one or two, um, and uh, <laughs> yeah. we can see what happens with it. Well, but, we but can tell us, walking the dog. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, you know, when the domino falls, you got to get Domino out there to sort things out. Does, 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 does Domino not want nothing to do with that one, or is is Domino trying to? I think he's to, just letting get on with it. To be honest. Oh really? All right. <laughs> Well, we have, we've got dog drama going on here on in the trenches. That's okay. No, I do apologize. No worries. No worries, man. We like the sound effects. It's perfect. It's it's. <laughs> you know what? That dog barking is is much. I'm used to it because I I can tone it out just like I tone out Glenn Sobel's uh, drum practice every single night in the dressing room. <laughs> now, does, does the heap? Do you guys share a dressing room or do you guys uh, do you leave um, separate dressing rooms and let the drummer have his own room so he can? You know, man, if we, were in, if, if we were in the Albert Hall or or, or in any major venue in the world, we'd all be huddled together in one corner. <laughs> I love it. I we love we it. stay we stay together, mate, through thick and thin. You know, I yeah. love it. Uh, well, we we do we do for better for worse, obviously, because yeah, yeah. But you know what we've done? We've brought in our practice amps in the same dressing room as Glenn's uh, practice drum pads. So it's just yeah, a, yeah. a cacophony of. Uh, uh, of just I don't but know. You, you kind of get used to that, don't you? That that yeah. racket. <laughs> it is chaos, and it's and it's yeah. kind of a nice racket too. Yeah, no doubt yeah, about yeah, it. Yeah. We, yeah. we 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 uh, we live stream a bit from the dressing room, uh, before show, pre show, and after show. We do it for this uh, thing we call the all excessors, and um, we're doing it like I put this thing together where in certain legs of the tour, um, I want to have more access because I feel sometimes. If you bear everything on your social media, maybe that's too much for the the average person that follows you. But if you want the hardcores to like really get in depth, then let them have it. And yeah, yeah. is there something like that that you have with your eye heap where you have an in depth access to the band where they can see things and uh, see go go deeper than just the surface? Oh yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, I, th I think you know. I think. Most bands do now, don't they? Have this sort of meet and greet thing. They, you know, come backstage and meet the band. Um, some come and have dinner with us. You know, um, nice. um, we even do sound checks where um, guys can come up and do a, a number with us. Get yeah. out of here! Okay, okay. So that, yeah. that's a whole so, other yeah. level. That's a whole we, other we, level. Back. We embrace that whole thing. Yeah, we, we think it's very important. You know. And, and But unfortunately, somewhere around late 2019, 2020, right when you guys are ready to embark on this official 50-year anniversary, ish. The, ish, the whole world sort of shuts down. And with it, the meet and greets, with it, the jamming on stage, with it, the, the, the whole rock show. So what was it like for the band uh, to, to work through that and then regroup and then, you know, say, hey, we're doing it this year 
it's happening, and then let the floodgates open? I think it's just, um, you know, we're, we're in the starting blocks, aren't we? We're, not, we're ready to go. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, we, we, just, we just can't wait to get out and do it, you know. I mean, um, whereas at the moment I'm kind of, because um, I've been there from the beginning, I'm kind of um, putting a show together that kind of encompasses maybe a lot of songs that we haven't played for a while or um, or some we haven't played ever, you know, and, and trying to get a show together that's really exciting, which gives a, a real travel through our career, you know, a 50-year 50, 50 career-ish. Absolutely. <laughs> and um, and, and, and um, so I'm, I'm presently doing that at the moment, then I'll just send it out to everybody. The, the, the most important thing is that when you give people, you know, when you've got a history like we have, and you've got Bernie joining us in 1986. When you go to the earlier tracks, I think it's, it, I leave it down to him to decide. I can give him five tracks and, and he'll probably say two of them he can really deliver. And, you know, and he's, he's the guy up front that's actually got to sell the song on the night and believe it and feel it. So um, I, I go on those emotions um, rather than di being dictatorial and say, we've got to do this, we've got to do that, you know, so. So I, I feel there's two ways of treating someone like you that has been around since the beginning, someone that's been around since day one. Um, they're either going to look at you as like the Oracle or Yoda, someone that has all encompassing knowledge, or they're going to look at you as someone like don't touch grandpa in the Texas chainsaw massacre where they just keep them in the, in the wheelchair and every once in a while they let them hit the hammer of the victim. I mean, am I going too weird on that reference there of Texas chainsaw part two? Do you have a, do you have a, any sort of, no, no. Um, so are you treated more as the Oracle? Um, yes. Yeah. I'd have okay. to say yes. Um, you know, I, I take over quite a few of the announcements on stage and, and give a background to some of the songs where they come about and, and how they came about and uh, and things like that. Yeah. So yeah, uh, part one. I, I'll go with part one. Okay. Part but two. Again, your, no disrespect. Your, your, your question. I would have to say that I've got too much passion and energy for you to think otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? No disrespect to Don't Touch Grandpa because I actually had a band at one point called Don't Touch Grandpa. Oh, really? <laughs> dire directly influenced from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre Part 2, which I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm not even... Yeah, I, I, are, you a, are you a movie buff? Because, I, I mean, you know that Coop watched... You know, he never, never met a movie he didn't like or didn't actually watch. Um, but, you know, Alice Cooper goes to the movies to make two, three times a week. Um, are you guys wow. are in the band... Does the band have any of those hobbies or, or, or sort of things that they do on the road? Are you a big movie buff or do you guys kind of just keep kind of low key? Well, you know, um, you know, the two of us, of course, if somebody's seen something or a good movie um, and they think, well, you know, maybe the guys are like this. We'll, we'll throw it up on the on, on the TV and, and, and have a listen to it, you know, all together, watch it all together. But um, generally, you know, um, especially through um, this period of COVID and lockdown, um, Netflix have been um, well used, that one would say. <laughs> <laughs> you finished uh, Netflix. Um, may, maybe overused. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to say during the pandemic, I finished the internet. We all finished the internet. <laughs> yeah, but, but one, I mean, my, my favorite all time film would be One Through the Cooker's Nest. <laughs> that, that's my all time favorite film. So that's your, okay. I, I, get I, I watched it. Big, that time. Big time Chief. Time. I mean, Big Chief is Big in Chief, there, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and who was the nurse? Nurse was it Nurse Ratchet? No, that was someone. Maybe that was a different movie. Or was who was the nurse in? Um... Yeah, you've got me there, mate. I, I'm used to the names. I don't even know the names of our songs. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is, you know what? Everybody that's in the chat, they they'll. they'll completely figured out in a second they'll put the name in the nurse and one flew over the cuckoo's nest i assume it was like the shining coming up all of a sudden we went on to a little bit of a horror uh, off ramp but that's what we do here in the trenches we kind of go with what uh what we're talking about at the exact moment but i i am mean, going to veer it more towards rock and roll right now and guitars because obviously us both being guitar players us both being less paul players um has it always been uh gibson's or have you uh played different types of guitars over the year and have you had any of your own uh models of guitars um basically um i have got some lovely old gibsons i, I had my, my first black ball um black beauty let's black black beauty. beauty was actually stolen from a studio 
all over the chest of London, which was terrible. Hold on. We have animation for that because before we get into this story, Vic, you this is a question that we usually ask and I, it just came out. You just blurted it out, but this is the one that you, <laughs> this is the one that got away, Vic. What do you say? <laughs> I feel that we should make that animation even like a four times as long, Vic, because, you know, it would really drag it out. But usually we ask this question uh, to every guest that comes on, like a piece of equipment, perhaps it's a guitar, an amplifier, uh, maybe even an effect that was either lost, stolen, or they had to sell. And you just gave us a huge, <laughs> huge story about your first Les Paul Black Beauty, which I, I just so you know, folks, weighs the same amount as probably a five-year-old child. <laughs> it's you know? very heavy. <laughs> very heavy. So tell us the story of how that got stolen. And uh, do you wish, or, or is there any other piece of equipment that you wish you had back even more than that guitar? You know, I think that's, that, that's the one. Um, well, actually, we were recording an album. Um, I think it's called Equator uh, down in Jacob's Studios down in the south of England. And, uh, you know, the guitar cases, you know, they, they, they used to be quite flimsy, but then they made them like coffins, didn't they? <laughs> Very heavy. And like, so you, you can almost pick it up and not know the guitar was in there. They, they were that kind of heaviness. And we finished those, ran, those Anvil road cases, right? Yeah. Those, uh, I, I, and, 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 cases. Uh, we finished the, 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 the recording and, I, you know, left it with all the crew and everything else. And um, evidently one of the builders there had his eye on it and took it. That's the way it's been explained to me later on. But um, their crew just locked it all up, took it to the, our lock-up in London and um, left it there. And then when we, we went to tour again, we had it up with no guitar there. So we knew where it was previously, so we knew it was stolen from there. And um, so I immediately got on to the police and um, phoned them up and said, look, you know, there were guitar stolen, Black Beauty, Les Paul, Diddle League, all the stuff. And... Um, and I said, you know, who am I talking to? Because I need, if I've got your details, I know I'm going to contact every time I ring up. And he said, Sergeant Box was his name. <laughs> and I went, what? ching. I said, Dad? Well, I, said I, said, I think the guitar's going to come back to me. This is made This is made to measure this, you know. Sergeant Box, Mick Box, it's got to happen. There has to be some sort it of never did. <laughs> It never did. It never did. Oh. Then the insurance wouldn't pay out on it because they said it could have been stolen either from the journey from from the studio to the lock wow so, that was uh, truly one that got away with no happy ending yeah. and right. that one and, and i had uh, to, to, to go back even further when i first got it um i had the telecaster before then which which i i really wish i had but i had to part exchange it to get the the les paul and i had right. to wait about six weeks for it to come over from kalamazoo in 1969 and, um, and, of course, when it came, it was the holy grail for me. It was heaven, you know. But I love the fact um, that it, it just didn't stay with me, mate. <laughs> Mick Box got a Gibson Les Paul from Kalamazoo, uh, Michigan, which used to be the headquarters of Gibson before they relocated to Nashville. So for all of you uh, guitar enthusiasts that uh, want to think that Gibson is only based out of Nashville, no, Kalamazoo is the original home. I love it. That's a great story. Um, so just to interject, can I interject a little bit more? Because the other guitars that, that – um, I, start, I used to take the, my other Gibsons around the world with me, but they, get, get, they got trashed by, by airline people, you know, they were throwing it around. And every time we opened the case, it was something broken, needed fixing. And they were too precious. So I, I tried to find a company that would, um, you know, I could take their guitars on the road. And um, I found a guy in um, Toronto, in Canada, um, called Carparelli, Mike Carparelli. And he was making guitars. And I, and I spoke with him. And he, he sent one over to me and I put it on and I went, oh, this is, this is fantastic, you know. And I had it on for about two weeks and I went, okay, this is it. This, you know, and I've been a carpet really man ever since. But nice. going on from there. Oh, wow, there's of, more. Of, of late, we do a thing in, in, in Germany called uh, Rock Meets Classic. And it's, yes. um, it's like a 40-piece orchestra. And with, you know, about four or five artists. On. We did it with Alice, funny enough. I did wanted to talk Bernie, about that, yeah. Alice. And um, Steve Luthka did it with us, and we've become great mates. And so um, 
at the moment, I'm getting one of Sig Luthica's Luke 3 um, HH uh, guitars being made for me now to be sent over. So who knows? I might end up playing Steve's guitar. <laughs> nice, man. You've been playing a lot of different guitars, but obviously the, the bread and butter seems to be the Gibsons from the old uh, school. Yeah, but... yeah, that's my first love. Definitely. But but I love the fact that you mentioned uh, rock meets classic because to be honest with you, that's right when the world shut down. Uh, rock meets classic. I think you had to like you did a couple dates and then it, it uh, got cut short basically early 2020. And I'm not sure if you were on that run. No, with... we were the, the two previous. The yeah. two previous. Okay, yeah, because I've seen Rock Meets Classic, and it's a b very cool thing. Um, I was at some music fest, Music Mesa in, in Frankfurt, and uh, just so happened that you guys were coming through town. So um, I went and saw that show, um, and it was great. To uh, The band is great. It's basically you take the classic hits, but you then have this huge orchestra that... Uh... The, the, the nice thing about it is, is the songs take on another dynamic with an orchestra. You know, there's a lushness to it that, that maybe isn't that the band doesn't deliver. You know, the band's more raw, so it's yeah. really nice to have that contrast. And and, and it really touches you. You know, you, you really feel it with the with maybe the in the way that you originally were thinking that keyboards could uh, add emulate to the early yeah. sound yeah. of your eye heap. Then yeah. this orchestra even gives it another different flavor. Because I, I remember yeah. Gypsy with with one of your bigger um, one of the big hits and Easy Living. They're both rockers and they're both, but they're both, you know, the guitar riff supports Gypsy, whereas Easy Living, it's, it's, you know, it's, you have a guitar heavy a sound. Drive, isn't it? It's a big, yeah. big yeah. drive, yeah. And the guitar is recorded where it's right up in your face, you know. So that's, right. that's I love it. <laughs> now, are you one of those guys that, uh, experiments around a lot with different types of amps and different types of technology, or are you just like, I'll oh, plug it into a Marshall, mate? Well, I was with Marshall for, for, for many, many years. And then when Jim Marshall passed away, I think his son Paul took over and then he left. And the kind of um, loyalty and dynamic that we used to have with Marshall kind of got diminished. Okay. You know, they went into, um, you know, making fridges and headphones. And, <laughs> you know, the, it was yeah. all kind of diverse stuff happening and that, yeah. you know. And, and they, were, they were more interested in the up-and-coming players rather than, the loyalty of, of, of people like myself, etc. So um, I found a company in, in Germany um, called Engel Amplifiers. Okay. And they're a family-based um, company. And they're fant the amps are just fantastic. Yeah. Um, you know, Steve Morse used, used one. He's got his own signature. Richard Blackmore had his own signature one. Uh, and so, they were, you know, I knew it was in good company right there, you know. And I got yeah. the, the lowdown on it from Richard Faulkner from um, Judas Priest. Okay. Um, yeah, good, Richie Faulkner. Yeah, good friend, and and he uh, the Falcons we call him. He he was um, he said, look, I've had these for two years. Um, I've got two amps. I never used anything but the one, <laughs> and so the reliability and the sound. You know, what more do you want? Especially sure. on the road. Like hey, that. Germans make amazing automobiles, and you and I are both involved with German amplifier companies as well. I'm playing Hughes and Kentner these days. Oh, and yeah, too. and again, yeah, really, yeah, it's just yeah, the engineering right. and the reliability is uh, great. So there you go, a little little <laughs> plug right there for you. Yeah, get, get, nice. <laughs> get get that angle, uh, get that angle logo in there for uh, Mister <laughs> Mister Mick Box there as well. Um, let's talk a little bit about this uh, upcoming tour that you have, a fifty-ish uh, anniversary. Um, you announced it in uh, late 2021, and uh, as extensive touring, I know that uh, some of the dates, because of the current situation that's happening in uh, Ukraine, Russia, uh, some of those dates are being modified a bit. But uh, right now, where does it stand? How many dates? How many countries? And uh, when do you guys kick off? It's a, um, well, we're doing a lot of festivals, and I believe we're doing some with you um, in Europe um, in June, July, August. Then come September, that's when the, the 50th anniversary starts, really. And we'll take that all the way up to Christmas. It was originally 62 shows in 25 countries in just over two and a half, three months. Wow. So it's quite extensive. Yeah. Uh, we've lost it because of the war and everything else. And God bless those people, and we, we wish them 
you know, all the love and peace in the world. But at the moment, you know, there's about a two week period within that tour we had that we lost. Wow. Okay. I see. Well, so, so you do, I mean, you are going to be out there. You are going to be um, definitely making the rounds. Um, I see that uh, the United States, North America, um, we're looking they, at the they, USA they, early next year. Okay, yeah, because yeah. there's some people in the chat now going, well, Europe's got all the dates. What about us? What about us? So uh, rest assured, uh, the heap, or the eep, as I call them, uh, <laughs> will, will be uh, will be getting somewhere uh, across the pond, so to speak, in 2023, correct? Yeah, our agent, our agent is working on it right now, so we, we're very hopeful that that will, that will come to fruition, yeah. Cool. We have an agent uh, every single week as well. We call the, our agent the fan of the week. And, um, you know, we don't allow him to come out to dinner with us or her to uh, jam on stage with us. But we do put their picture up on our uh, podcast. So this week's fan of the week, Vic, are we ready for that? Let's run it. This week's fan of the week is Dean Safieri. Safieri. Dean, thank you so much for being a loyal fan. Um, Monsters of I Rock Cruise. And uh, you're an all accessor. Uh, you've been very, very uh, important to uh, promoting the podcast and promoting uh, and showing up into the chat every single week. And again, folks, if this is your first time watching in the trenches podcast, uh, we'd love for you to stick around and just do that by hitting that subscribe button. That's right there over there, over there. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much for doing that for me, Mick. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, you can uh, come visit us each and every week. Um, obviously, not every week are we going to have living legends and uh, iconic rockers uh, such as Mickbox as we do this week. Um, in fact, sometimes we're going to have some new schoolers, and that's no different with next week because we will be uh, featuring next week's guest. That's Willem Wolf, and that is Billy Idol's son and uh, current rock and roller himself. There's definitely shades of Idol in there with William Wolf. We'll be talking all about his new musical projects and what he's got going on. So um, speaking of, um, because you're an old schooler like I am, um, and you're obviously still uh, listening to new music and uh, gathering ideas and uh, sort of getting influence, getting inspiration from the younger bands. Is there any um, newer bands that uh, you feel uh, are sort of taking that torch of rock and roll and bringing it to uh, the next level? Um, well, if, uh, the, the, a few few things like, you know, Rival Sons, uh, but they've been around for a while now, you know, and Greta Van Fleet were, you know, they wear their heart on their sleeve, don't they? So there's, yes, there's, yes, there's, yes. There's, a, there's a few out there that, you know, that, that um, uh, you can see, see where their influences come from. Um, but it's really funny because I, 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 I I find that I've discovered something. I go, that sounds great. And you find out it's the winery dogs with Richie Carson. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Billy Sheila and the Unfortunate, you know. And then um, I'll I, I tell you what, I just just seen recently in London, I went and saw um, Smith Cotson, you know, Andrew Smith from Iron Maiden and, and Richie Cotson, um, Bruce Poison and all the all the solo stuff he's done. And what a player, mate. Fantastic. Loved it. it, it uh, they had good songs, played brilliantly. He's even got his wife on bass. Now, that's happy days, isn't it, when you're out on tour? <laughs> or. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you might say that. No, this is pro. It's just like, hey, it's just like TikTok. There's pros and cons to both, all right? <laughs> <laughs> well, he seemed very happy, so we'll go with the tick. <laughs> Nurse Ratchet. There she is. <laughs> That is not Richie Cotson's wife, Vic. Why would you put that up there? That's you know, we want Richie on the on the podcast. You're not doing yourself any favors, Vic, by getting putting Nurse Ratchet on. There. He's, he's so, such a wicked player, mate. What, dude, what a player! And, what a, and vocalist. Well, he's a player. He's what voiced. a great what what a great vocalist. What a great. Uh, oh. But you know, enough about Richie. More about Mick Box right now. Come on, because R Richie isn't on our podcast yet, and I and I don't know if he will be now after that Nurse Ratchet photo that our producer Vic Chalfont, that's at Vic Chalfont, 
put on. So if you have any comments, if you want, <laughs> no, I'm just joking, guys. Um, here we go. Uh, we have a little segment called Never Let the Truth Get in the Way of a Good Story. It's what uh, my boss likes to uh, say in almost every interview. Never let the truth get in the way of a good uh, story. Uh, fact or fiction, uh, was there a huge competitiveness between Uriah Heep and Deep Purple back in the day? Uh, no. True. Fit. It's, it's true? No true? Yeah. Is no, it fact? I'll, I'll tell you for why. Because um, when we first started out, there was a uh, there was a thing called the Hamwell Community Centre, which was not a rehearsal uh, uh, place at all. It was just two halls, um, one this side, one this side. And this side was Deep Purple, and this side was Uriah Heep. And it was a hell of a racket going on. But, you know, we certainly come out with some great music um, that, that went on both our first albums. So um, I think the... There was no sort of rivalry, rivalry as, as such because, you know, they were going into a virtuoso type bag, if you like, and we were going into a song type bag with lots of vocals and things, you know. So, um, exactly. Um, you know, the only the only common thing we ever had was like the hammered organ and maybe the fact that we were both playing loud rock music, you know. Okay. So the fact that... Vic, our producer, put up fact when it was actually fiction. But maybe, it was, there you go. There's the true story. There was there was nothing but peace, love, and uh, domino dogs uh, for the Uriah Heap and Deep Purple. I mean, if there was any competitiveness, it was it was a healthy thing. You know, it wasn't yeah. it wasn't a, a, you know a bad thing at all. Well, you mentioned it earlier by, you know, there during that time, there were a lot of two name bands. It was, you know, uh, like you said, Black Sabbath, Deep Purple, Uriah Heep. It kind of and, yeah. and there was sort of this admiration that you guys all looked to each other and then did your own thing. And so, and I, I wouldn't say borrow, but you guys it definitely influenced. You're in the same you're in the same genre in the same well, years, you know and you're what, innovating. The, the way I explain it really is that you know, um, as a guitarist, I don't even play like Richie. Richie didn't play like Tony Iommi. You know, um, all the guitars were individual, all, all the drums were individual, the keyboard players were individual, the bass players were individual, and the vocalists were all individual. And it's just some of those parts that gave each band their particular flavor you know, which made them all different and stand out. And um, I think we lose that a bit in today's um, market because there's a lot of people that are sounding the same. Um, I, I'll give you an example. You know, guitar, I, I use this analogy. Um, guitarists go into a, a, a guitar college or university and yep. they come out two years later and they're all playing fantastic guitar, but they're all sounding the same. Within that two-year period, nobody's actually picked up the individuality of any of them and developed that. And um, so that, that, that's where it's so much different today as it was back then. Right. Are you able to practice that much even these days? Or is it is the guitar the one thing that you uh, – because when you, when you talk about that whole thing about keeping your chops up and maybe going off and learning some sort of new innovative track, um, are you able to just jam on your guitar all that much? Or is it do you reserve it mostly for live shows? Again, it'll be doodling, mate. I just doodle. You know, I'll pick the guitar up and play it. And, you know, and I sort of practice it in, in, in the practice sense, you know going over things and over things, you know, I just pick it up and play. Um, I'll put, some, uh, put a drum track up and just jam to it or whatever and um, see what comes out of it. And then if there's any little thing that, that, that becomes attractive to me, I'll record it, which we can do on our iPhones now. <laughs> <laughs> and you bang it down onto that. And then you, 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 get, you get a little catalog of those. And then one day when I'm walking the dog in the park or something, I'll listen to them and a few of those will stand out and I go, right, I'm going to develop that one when I get back home now and I'll come back up to my music room and, and start writing. So basically my practice is, is writing. Very good. And, and when that idea, that germ of an idea becomes a demo, then does it get sent to the rest of the guys in the band or do you well, guys well, end up I, I, wait and meet inside a room? Yeah, I write, I write a, a lot with our cable, cable players. So when there's an album to be, um, to be written, um, we use the, the main writers and, um, I'll get together with him. He's got 100 keyboard ideas. I've got 100,000 guitar ideas. We get together and quickly we're, you know, we're very in tune with each other. 
um, musically, lyrically, and everything else. So we write very quickly together. So um, it's a great experience. So yeah, and then we we um, we try not to harp too much on um, on developing things too far. You can get hung up on the sounds, can't you? You know, I've got to get the bass sounding right. But really, they just the songs speak, no matter how you present it, right? So, um, but there again, you, you can go to the boys and you sit down in the rehearsal room and you play them all the tracks. And a couple of them you, that you've been working hard on are in the bin in 30 seconds. <laughs> we don't like that. Bang, in the bin. <laughs> you never know which one's going to be that magic. Bang, yeah. yeah. So you have to have like, you know, 50 and then you'll get them whittled down to about, you know, 12 or whatever you put on the album. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, you've talked a little bit about it. I don't know if you want to drop any more Easter eggs about this new um, album that you have. Be are you going to, is there a new album in the works? And if there is, when can fans expect that? Is it going to be sometime after the 50-ish uh, anniversary tour? Or is uh, what, what's happening with the recording process of the band right now? At the moment, we're recording a new album. It's in the bag. We use the same. Um, Not in the bin, in the bag. In the bag. It's two it's different things. <laughs> no bins. The bin, the bin was full, I might add. <laughs> <laughs> but the rest of it is in the bag. And we used Jay Russell that produced, that produced the last album, Living the Dream, which for us was marvelous because it was, um, you know, revered by both the, the media, the press, as, as well as the fans, and all saying it was one of the best of our career. So to get an album like that 50 years on and get those sort of accolades, we kept with the same team. Um, so yeah, it's a great album. It's rocking. It's got all the um, elements that, that Heap's known for, um, and all the musicality and the lyrics and everything else and the lyricism. And um, so yeah, it's 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 there. Uh, at the moment, we're in the process of uh, choosing titles, getting all the text, getting the artwork, choosing the artwork, and, uh, and all those sort of things. Then that'll get presented to the record company. Then, to be honest, it, it, it'll be decided by them. We're with a company called Silver Lining. And it's our first album with them. And they'll just look at, um, as you well know, Roxy, you know, we're in the music business and we do the music and then the business the side business. takes care of it, that side, you know. Uh, so they'll release it when they feel that with their investment, they'll get the best reward. <laughs> it's, it's a nice way of putting it, I guess. I love so it. we don't really have a say in it, but um, they'll find a place to release it when... Um, when, when they feel best. Really. But first and foremost, you've got the uh, anniversary tour to take care of and a lot of dates, a lot of yeah. festival dates right now that uh, we'll be crossing paths with. We've uh, covered a lot of uh, hard-hitting topics. We've talked about songwriting. We've talked about equipment. Uh, we've talked about uh, special guitars. We've talked about the evolution of the band. But I think the question on everybody's mind is what hair conditioner do you use? And how do you keep it so lovely, silky, smooth on the road, man? I have been one lucky dude because yeah. I've still got it. I've still got the hair. I've got no idea. I, I don't. I don't pamper it. I don't do anything other than wash. And most of the time, I don't even dry it. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that the, the secret is don't mess with it too much. <laughs> There you go. Life advice. Because that is usually how we end the podcast with some life advice. Don't mess with your hair, folks. If you mess with your hair too much, you'll end up like me. If you don't mess with your hair. No. I've got a lot of facial hair I'm going to be messing with pretty I mean, soon. You know, there was a point where, where I used to dye my hair and that, that, that became, you know, every hotel room looked, looked like a disaster when I left it. <laughs> <laughs> Black oh. towels every, everywhere, you know. And I, just, I, got fed, I got fed up with that, so I just grew it out to grey. And uh, anyway, I mean, who knows? After this, I might even get a part in Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> Dumbledore, <laughs> ah, I love it. When when, uh, when did you when did you just accept it? When, when, what year did you did you go did you go grey early or did you just uh... late late? I was oh, yeah, I, I, did, I couldn't I couldn't give in. <laughs> <laughs> You went, I you fought it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, uh, then I found that the products, um, you know, they do damage your hair a bit, you know, and uh, you start feeling that you haven't quite got as much as you, you thought you had. And then, and then and I stopped it all and it all 
it all came good again. So I, I just want to come clean to our uh, In the Trenches audience. Those of you that are just tuning in now, we have not spent the entire podcast talking about hair care products and uh, the upkeep of Mick Box's hairdo. Um, the thing is, we've talked about so much, and you have to recap and uh, tell some friends about all the things that we've talked about with this a very special episode with Mick Box of the band Uriah Heap. Um, let's go real quick with the uh, tour dates that uh, you've got uh, coming up. And I don't know, Vic, do you have any uh, graphics for that? And do you have, no, he does not. He says there were too many dates. How about uh, social media context? Do you have that? There you go, Vic. Thank you very much. Uh, for those of you that are listening to us on the audio broadcast, Mick, would you mind uh, telling people the best way to get in touch with you? Yes. Um, we've got at Mick underscore box underscore Uriah underscore heap. Uh, then you've got straight Mick box. Then you've got at Mick underscore box. Then you've got my own website, which is Mick dash box dot net. And all those links would be on uh, the website would be Mick dash box dot net. Uh, so you can find Uriah Heap on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter as well on the links provided. And if you are listening to us on audio broadcast, what are you doing there? Um, because I'm not going to go through all those handles again. Um, I want you guys to at least uh, go on and watch us on their YouTube official channel and hit that subscribe button that Vic Shelfont, our producer, just put up again. I'd like to thank uh, uh, everybody that's been a part of the In the Trenches uh, team this week, thank you very much, Federica, uh, for coming on. And thank you very much to Naomi and Bellin for being our backstage guests as they hang out. So just chill out there for a little bit. Um, Mick, I look forward to crossing paths with you. Oh, my God. Prell. <laughs> Wait a second. Is that your secret? Prell shampoo? Mine was, gee, your hair smells terrific. I don't I know. I would like to say I've never used that shampoo ever. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? It's it's. I think it's Prell and Paul Mollib. It's either dishwashing soap and and uh, hair soap. It's probably the same sort of difference. But uh, yeah, we've probably messed up the same sort of amount of hotel rooms through the years and towels with dyeing our hair inside those rooms. <laughs> yes. <So. laughs> Agree. But, but Mick, uh, any sort of parting words for our fans uh, besides uh, don't mess with your hair that uh, you've learned over the years that uh, has gotten you uh, through uh, hard times, good times, um, everything else in between? Uh, anything that you want to relay to our fans? Um, well, you know, my, my, my thing in life is, you know, if you've got a passion for something, it's all important because that, that gives you the drive to, I mean, especially in our business, one door open, another one slams in your face, you know, and it gives you the belief to keep walking through those doors and achieve the goals that you're looking for. So um, once you've got a passion for something, you know, live it, take it to its limits, you know, and uh, and enjoy every moment. Well, That's my, my, my mantra. There you go. And I think it's a very good one. And uh, I can hardly wait till uh, we hook up somewhere on the road in Europe this uh, in the coming months. It's going to be great, Mick. Uh, hold on for one second while I say goodbye to everybody. But uh, you've been listening to Mick Box of Uriah Heap on the In the Trenches podcast. Uh, I am your host, Ryan Roxy. Uh, next week, again, our guest will be Billy Idol's son, William Wolf. And uh, again, uh, congrats to our fan of the week, Dean Staffieri right over there and uh, everyone else that wants to become part of the uh, RGA and the all accessors and of course our debut of TikTok which is coming out later today uh, just follow us on Instagram and uh, all the different handles it's pretty much at Ryan Roxy and uh, on YouTube at Ryan Roxy official so hey we're out of here Mick thank you very Happy much days, again mate. Happy days hold on for one second but until next time everybody else I'm Ryan Roxy. Enjoy the ride. See ya. In the trenches with Ryan.